In November of 1990, Computer Gaming World magazine issue number 76 credited The Legend of Zelda with inspiring players of computer role-playing games to begin buying video game consoles. Comparing it with Wizardry, Ultima, Dragon Quest, Fantasy Star, and Ease, editor Roe Adams III called the game definitely a CRPG in spite of retaining some action-adventure features, praising its fine graphics, exciting monsters, intriguing puzzle mazes, and wide variety of items. That very same month, Dragon Magazine, the official magazine of Dungeons & Dragons then published by TSR, called The Legend of Zelda the first true role-playing game for the original Nintendo system, and its sequel, A Link to the Past, the best role-playing game now available for any cartridge machine. Last year I called The Legend of Zelda an RPG in a room full of gamers and narrowly got away with my life. I'm Toya, this is RPG Maniacs, where we like our RPGs the way we like our peanut butter, and we gotta get to the bottom of this. First off, what's at stake here? An RPG is just a genre, a way of classifying something. If Zelda is an RPG, it means it's sharing the pool with the likes of Final Fantasy, Persona, and Etrian Odyssey. Genres as an idea go all the way back to ancient Greece. In modern times, they are most often the product of marketing teams, who try to sell works to consumers based on their similarity to other works. The theory goes that if you liked The Intern, then you'll also like The Holiday and Ghosts of Girlfriend's Past, because they're all romantic comedies, which is absolutely not true in practice. Genres are useful, because they can help us locate similar works works in a sea of things we don't care about, but they are also reductive in that they try to compress the totality of a work down to a sequence of boxes that it checks. And as these magazine articles from nearly 30 years ago should demonstrate, they can also be highly subjective. Many creators write, paint, or code without even taking genre into account, and it falls to marketers to decide after the fact what hole a work falls into. In this case, Nintendo itself has branded Zelda as an RPG for years, which you can see just by searching the Nintendo eShop by genre. Even on the 3DS, Ocarina of Time is listed as an RPG. It's on the same page as Crimson Shroud. And it's not the only one. According to Nintendo, Majora's Mask, The Legend of Zelda, and Breath of the Wild are all in the same genre as Bravely Default, Secret of Mana, Devil Survivor, and Pokemon. All that said, what checkboxes represent the role-playing game? Many players would jump at the issue of numbers and statistics, arguing that if a game has no visible numbers in it or character stats, then that game cannot be an RPG. This is troubling. Many of the stats in RPGs are hidden from the player, and some games have gone so far as to completely conceal the numeric value of all their stats, including battle damage. For example, in 1996, Compile remade Mado Monogatari, a wizardry-style dungeon crawler originally for the MSX2 and PC-98, as a top-down RPG for the Super Famicom titled Mado Monogatari Big Kindergarten Kids. This remake obscures all numbers from the player, using visuals to convey the action. How fast the main character Arl dances corresponds to how high her hit points are, and her battle dialogue explains her current status, while the player's level progression is indicated by a growing number of stamps on their report card. The player never interacts with a numeric value directly, and it can be difficult to know one's exact level because the stamps have varying stages of vibrancy. If the player character has stats, but the player only interacts with them as shapes and images, is it still an RPG? It has to be if we're going to include Mado Monogatari within the genre, which means that Zelda using hearts instead of hit points and different colored swords in place of an attack stat isn't something that would disqualify it. Functionally, the player's hearts do act as both hit points and as a form of character level, increasing as a result of defeating major encounters and completing side quests, and those hearts also control how much damage they deal over the course of a playthrough, because the second and third level swords can only be obtained if the player has passed specific benchmarks for hearts. So numbers aren't what makes a game an RPG. This aspect of the genre has more to do with character growth and progression than with math, and Zelda certainly has that. Why did Computer Gaming World and Dragon Magazine both call Zelda an RPG? When you look at what these retrospectives are saying, the key phrases they use to describe RPGs are stronger over time, mazes, dungeons, puzzles, permanent boost, weapons, armor, spells, variety of monsters, and weapons and magic needed to overcome roadblocks. These descriptions imply that the genre has less to do with having numbers and more to do with the kinds of activities the player performs. To take a closer look at what makes an RPG an RPG, I turn to Dragon Quest and the way it was introduced worldwide some 30 years ago. For Japanese players, Dragon Quest was first introduced to them on February 11th, 1986 in a special issue of Weekly Shonen Jump titled Famicom Shinken or Famicom Godfist. 
For American players, their own introduction came in the form of a 36-page strategy guide packaged with the November 1989 issue of Nintendo Power magazine. While the Japanese ads focused on hawking Toriyama Akira's art, as he was already quite famous at the time from his work on Dragon Ball, the content of the ads across both cultures is fairly similar. Each emphasized this being the first RPG for the Nintendo Entertainment System, making note of its historic importance, and tried to articulate what an RPG was. Famously, the Japanese article was actually written by director Hori Yuji under the pseudonym Yute. Hori later confirmed in multiple interviews that Dragon Quest was inspired by his experiences playing Wizardry and Ultima, and that he had played Japanese forerunners of the genre like Mugen no Shinzo and the Black Onyx. So if anyone is qualified to define the RPG for us as it stood in 1986, it's him. But when trying to explain what an RPG is, Hori uses these key phrases. Defeat monsters, get stronger, get gold pieces, buy weapons and armor. The article doesn't actually mention leveling up at all, and the only specific stats mentioned are hit points and magic. Hori only talks about getting stronger through battle in the abstract sense. Meanwhile, Nintendo Power's introduction was considerably more detailed. The issue omitted any Toriyama artwork in favor of original pieces by both Terada Katsuya and Imai Suji, whose work helped westernize the overall look of Dragon Quest. Of note is that both of these artists also did illustrations for Nintendo Power articles and guides on The Legend of Zelda, which came out in the United States before Dragon Quest. Nintendo Power had a somewhat different take on the RPG. Consider how the key phrases both differ from and align with what we've seen up to now. A world of myths and dreams. Dragon Warrior is not just a game, it's a place and a time of great danger and greater deeds. A noble cause, a lost way of life, and mysteries as old as time. Search for gold and information, battle through the wilderness, building the strength of your character. You begin the game with nothing but a name. Develop a strategy, accumulate knowledge. Alone now, you enter the wilds of Alephgard, a game of high adventure and dark secrets, treasure to be won and tasks to perform. This is much heavier advertising than we find in Jump Magazine, and it's advertising necessitated by the circumstances. Dragon Ball did not arrive in the United States until 1995, so unlike in Japan, they couldn't just slap Toriyama's name on it and call it a day. And Dragon Quest was coming out three years late in the USA, pitting it against far more advanced NES titles like Zelda II, Legacy of the Wizard, and Fazanadu, making it look positively archaic by comparison. Nintendo Power associates the RPG with a broad sense of conflict and exploration, referring to great danger and greater deeds, and emphasizing how the player starts from scratch and works their way up in the world. Contrast that to a game like Super Mario Bros., where the player essentially starts and ends with the same abilities. They can acquire or lose fire flowers, but in an RPG, any such power-up would be a permanent form of growth rather than one constantly lost and regained. The player can do more at the end of the game than at the beginning. For one final set of definitions as to what the RPG is, I'd like to take a moment and refer back to the 1977 edition of Basic Dungeons & Dragons. This is all ancient history now, but the basic edition of D&D was actually deeply influential on Japanese role-playing games. D&D was not officially published in Japan until 1985, when Shinwa Limited brought over the 83 edition Basic Rules, which became locally known as the Red Box and Blue Box. Prior to this, fan translators in Japan created their own handwritten translations of the game. It's difficult to find surviving documentation about the fan translation period, and it's unknown exactly which version they used, but the 74 or 77 Basic Edition is a very likely candidate, both because it was easier to translate and because Shinwa found it difficult to market advanced Dungeons & Dragons to Japanese audiences when official translation finally began. To this day, Basic D&D remains more popular in Japan than the advanced rules, and in the 1980s, Basic D&D became the basis for the writing of so-called table talk replay novels derived from real play sessions like Record of the Lotus War and Nanatsu no Saidan, or Seven Altars, which were then adapted into popular manga, anime, and video game series, and Basic D&D was also what went on to inspire Japanese-created tabletop RPGs like Sword World RPG and Aryan Rod. For our purposes, the most important thing about Basic D&D is how it influenced Final Fantasy, which in the Western world is the poster child for the electronic RPG. Not only was Basic D&D's entire monster manual copied into Final Fantasy through enemies like the Crawler, Black Pudding, and Beholder, but the spell lists and character classes were themselves taken from Basic, with the Red Mage corresponding to the Elf, the fighter to the fighting man, black mage to magic user, and white mage to cleric. 
So what does Basic's introduction to D&D say about RPGs? While you might expect a lot of numbers and die rolls, what it actually specifies is much broader. The key phrases that come out of this introduction are creates a character, adventure in a series of dungeons, tunnels, secret rooms and caverns, fearsome monsters, fabulous treasure and frightful perils, characters grow in power and ability, battling more terrible monsters recovering bigger and more fabulous treasure. From all these sources, we can distill that the RPG isn't really about something as simple as numbers, but about the broad idea of character growth, treasure hunting, conflict, and exploration. Based on these, I would propose that a more accurate definition of a role-playing game includes any game where the player performs dungeon crawls, braving monstrous holds and navigating mazes to recover treasure, grows stronger over time by completing tasks, accumulates and exchanges resources, whether they be money, items, or something else, and makes strategic decisions related to their survival. With these four criteria in mind, we can see that direct examination of Zelda makes it undeniably an RPG. The player traverses dungeons in search of treasure chests and loot, grows stronger by acquiring weapons, items, tunics, and shields, accumulates rupees that they then spend on consumables and new equipment in towns, and weighs the strategic value of using different potions and limited availability items like bombs and arrows. The fact that the player character in Zelda never levels up is immaterial. The cast of Crimson Shroud never gain character levels either, and being a literal simulation of tabletop role-playing games with touchscreen-fueled dice chucking, that game is as close to the RPG ethos as you can get. What matters is that all four of the common criteria of RPGs are met by Zelda, making Zelda as natural a fit for the RPG genre as Xanadu or Adventure of Mana. At the heart of this issue is the fact that RPG has become a much broader category than it once was. There was a time frame, a time frame when 6 megabytes was enormous, that everybody could sit down and agree that The Legend of Zelda, Tower of Draga, Dragon Quest, Final Fantasy, and Fantasy Star were all in the same genre, and they were sharing it with Wizardry, Ultima, The Black Onyx, and Dungeon Master. They shared that genre because of hardware limitations, which forced each of them to be a simulation, an abstraction of what could be rather than what was. As early as the mid-2000s, you could simulate generally realistic combat and exploration in real time in which the 3D world you were viewing lined up one-to-one -one with the world you actually lived in. And that is more true today than it was 19 years ago. But when these franchises were first created, that was an impossibility. Video games existed on a 2D plane and had to do their best to create something which could reasonably gamify a real-world interaction, and then the player could interpret that. Characters lining up waiting for their ATB gauges to fill was never meant to be taken literally as an actual representation of what was happening in combat. It was always a means of resolving it, a game mechanic, in the way that rolling dice in D&D resolves combat. It's an abstraction. But the opening up of hardware limitations and the expansion of hardware has driven the subgenrefication of RPGs. Wind Waker and Breath of the Wild are not abstractions. Everything that is happening in those worlds is happening one-to-one -one with how they are actually supposed to be. And we don't really have the terminology to clarify yet what these new subgenres are. They're action RPGs, of course, but turn-based RPG doesn't really encapsulate the abstraction part of traditional Final Fantasy. We can agree that there are a general set of principles which govern what the RPG is, and that a game meets those criteria. But within that, what else is it? That's the question that comes after answering the question of, is Zelda an RPG? Yes. Now what? This has been Toya. Thank you for joining me today. If you liked what you saw, please consider liking and subscribing to support the channel. You can find me on Twitter at VanguardUs, on Twitch at DecodeToya, and of course, right here at RPG Maniacs.